Welcome to everyone who is joining us today for our first ECR Wednesday webinar hosted by eLife to give early career researchers a platform to discuss issues important to you and your research career. We are delighted to be joined today by four experienced researchers, our three panellists, who will be introduced shortly, as well as the chair for today's webinar, Emmanuel Veer. Emmanuel is a junior team leader at University College London and a founding member of the eLife Early Career Advisory Group. We'll hear more from her in a second. But first, allow me, Naomi, to give a warm welcome to all of you joining us individually, as well as those of you watching in a group. Hello to the Institute of Neuroscience at the University of Oregon and to the postdocs attending the Crossroads event at the Stowers Institute. Many thanks to Sonia Sen, Swami Venkatesh and Lisa Hodges for making those live streams possible. If you'd like to live stream the next webinar, feel free to get in touch with us. We'd love to help. I'll pass over now to Emmanuel, who will introduce the panellists and say a little more about what these webinars will be about. Hi, everyone. So my name is Emmanuel. Uh, I'm originally from Belgium and I've, despite my eight years in the UK, I've kept my French accent and I apologize for that. Um, so I hope you'll still be able to understand me. So I've been on the Early Career Advisory Group at eLife for almost three years now. And uh, I was initially approached when I was a postdoc at the Gordon Institute in Cambridge, UK. And the idea was um, eLife had just been founded and they needed uh, early career scientists to give ideas and brainstorm with them, alongside with them, uh, about the major challenges that we all face, either as postdoc, as um, students, PhD students, or even when we step, step up from the postdoc and go, if we're lucky enough, and move on to the next step and set up our own groups. So what are the main challenges and how could eLife support those challenges for early career? That was the aim of the group uh, when it was initially set up. I'm not on my own in this group. Um, I'm there with 14 or extremely talented international scientists. Uh, we meet each other together once a year, uh, usually in November, and this year's meeting is coming up. Uh, sorry about that. It's coming up in two weeks' time. And uh, we all together discuss uh, new issues that we face, new ideas that we may have. And we also vocalize that to eLife. Um, and Together, we try to come up with some new initiative that will support the early career uh, community. And I believe this is really working. This is why I'm still there and why I'm here today. And this, like today, what's happening right now is um, one of the best demonstrations that they, whatever we say uh, is taken into account. So last year at the General Assembly meeting, uh, the 14 of us discussed the possibility of having webinars that would uh, really be relevant for uh, the early career scientist. And this is it. This is happening. And um, I must say this would never have been born without the tremendous work of Naomi. Uh, who is really linking uh, the ECAC group and the eLife group together. Okay, so that said, um, I think we're all here to discuss something that's really, really becoming important and increasingly uh, present in our life science uh, daily and in our research, and this is preprints. So I think we all need to know a little bit about what these are, why they are important, why and how we could all benefit from those if we haven't yet. Uh, and then we will also uh, have a lot of questions, hopefully, and answers, and um, wrap up into a panel discussion. Uh, but first, I would like to introduce uh, all the panel people that are um, together with me today. The first one, um, ladies first, of course, is Jessica. So Jessica is a research fellow at Harvard, and she has been there um, since 2013. So Jessica, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, you are investigating intracellular organization in bacteria. She's um, a visiting postdoc, but no, she's mainly, her main activity is being the director of SAP Bio. And uh, I think, Jessica, when maybe it's your turn, um, we would all be very lucky if we could hear a little bit more about you, uh, about SAP Bio, because I've never heard about it myself. Um, then we have Buzz. 
uh, Buzz is at Princeton uh, since 2014, and Buzz is at the interface between biology and physics, so real science for people like me, like biologists. Um, and his research is exploring how biology can provide answer to our energy sustainability sorry, crisis. And uh, by applying physics principles, genetic engineering, and novel high throughput methods. Uh, and then finally, we have Nikolai. Nikolai, hi. Um, you are an assistant professor uh, also in Boston, if I read correctly. Um, and you are also a biologist. You are interested in the regulation of protein synthesis by a specialized ribosome and how this is coordinated with metabolism, cell growth, and differentiation. So to all of us uh, who are listening and joining us today, welcome, very warm welcome, and please ask your question throughout the webinar. And the way we'll deal with question is that we'll wait that all the presenters are done with their little introduction, and then we'll address question. If you have questions that you want to share, please use our Twitter live, um, a Twitter account, which is uh, using the hashtag ECR Wednesday. ECR stands for Early Career Research or Researcher. Um, so we all address the question at the end of the discussion. So you can also raise your hand through the hand icon on the webinar panel um, if you want to draw our attention or if you are happy to speak on the webinar. So let's just go ahead now and um, the first speaker today Okay. Jessica? Yes, all right. Are you able to hear me now? Yes, we are able to see your slides, yeah. Okay, okay, so, uh, and you are, are you able to, to see my slides now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, wonderful. All right, let me just go full screen. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> So as, as I think most of us who are aware of words on this webinar may know, um, a preprint is a way of communicating your research results before those results are formally published in journal. And um, so preprints are essentially defined as a manuscript that is posted online before or also during journal organized peer review. So this is distinct from a manuscript that might be the author's last version or a final version of record from a journal. They're sort of um, drafts, and, and certainly people can post them long before submitting to a journal, but frequently um, in practice uh, we are posting them around the same time as the submission date. And what I think is so exciting about preprints in comparison to, um, or in addition to other ways of thinking about opening up the scientific process and making our data more available earlier, is that um, they are very much compatible with journals, uh, especially because there's been a long tradition of the use of preprints in physics. So essentially, um, around the same time that one uh, might be submitting to a uh, a, a journal, you can also just submit your manuscript to a preprint server, and we can talk about what those are in a moment. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you can begin to get feedback on it while it's still under review at the, at the journal. So this is definitely not a new concept. Um, starting in 1991, Archive, uh, which is a website at Cornell University Lab Library, which hosts about 100,000 manuscripts per year. Um, has been sort of the place for people to exchange information uh, in the, the physics, computer science, mathematics world. Um, there is also a section of archives for biology that has been actually operating for over a decade. But recently, um, there are several other servers, um, most prominently BioArchive um, and also PeerJ Preprints, which are functioning especially for specific content areas. So for example, BioArchive is just for biology. And what I think is so exciting is that over the last couple of years, we've really seen an explosive growth of preprints. So here in blue, you can see the Archive to Bio section, which has been growing steadily over the years. But really, um, BioArchive has really taken off. 
And there's also other sites um, like F1000 Research, the Winnower, Preprints.org, Big Share, uh, of course, PeerJ Preprints. These are all contributing to this growth of preprints too. Uh, so I think this is really becoming a, a very exciting way of communicating results. And you may be asking, well, why would I want to do this? So I just want to outline um, a few of the major benefits. So uh, first, preprints are open access, uh, and um, they're immediately accessible so that anyone in the world can read them um, without having to worry about um, access limitations based on um, you know, embargoes, et cetera. It is public disclosure of recent invisible work um, for your PhD thesis fellowship or job. So the idea being that um, you can go ahead and share the information uh, that uh, dis describes your recent scientific advancements with people who otherwise might not be able to see them. And this, especially for those of us who are trying to progress through early career stages, who may have a limited body of work, uh, this is a really great boon uh, for demonstrating our ability to progress. We can get more feedback on our work. Um, instead of just receiving feedback from two or three anonymous peer reviewers, we can share them uh, this work with the world and really get input not only from people within our specific fields, but maybe people with specific expertise about a part of the manuscript, people who wouldn't otherwise be reviewing it. Um, we can control when the work is made public. Um, in other words, uh, I think that there's recently been a lot of attention paid to uh, the vagaries of peer review in terms of manuscripts getting submitted to a journal, then perhaps rejected, submitted to another journal, et cetera, and especially in cases where one lab is competing with another. It can be extremely um, valuable to have transparency in the process to show who knew what, when, uh, and at what time. Uh, and finally, I think the most important thing uh, besides all of these individual benefits that we can enjoy as individual scientists, making work available is the foundation of science. All discoveries depend on previous knowledge, and if we don't share our work, um, you know, we're limiting the future process of science. And it, so when our manuscripts um, are going through multiple cycles of review, revision, perhaps, you know, getting uh, bounced around uh, for months or maybe even years, um, that is a loss for um, the progress of human knowledge. So I, I think that preprinting can really accelerate science. The, I'm going to just go over three concerns that I hear most commonly with preprints. Um, uh, I, the first one is that somehow not be trusted to share work before peer review. Um, that, uh, you know, if we create a way for people to share the results before review, we'll end up with a lot of essentially garbage. I think that the experience of physicists has shown that this is a relatively minor concern. Um, there's a million manuscripts um, on archive. They're all, you know, the majority of them are, are high quality. The screening processes work um, in order to keep out material that is um, clearly doesn't belong there. And moreover, I think that even those of us in biology recognize that we are already sharing unpeer-reviewed work with one another all the time. Uh, we go to poster sessions, we put up our posters, uh, we give talks at meetings. And the reason that people don't put garbage up in these settings is because you have to stand next to it and you have to uh, uh, essentially stake your reputation on, on the work. And therefore, I think that um, the process of preprinting is not going to become immediately um, uh, trashed in the same way that people don't put up trash on, on posters. So the second concern is that journals won't accept my preprint. Um, in fact, uh, I would say the majority of journals at this point have quite liberal policies on accepting preprints, um, especially those that have dealt with physicists for a long time, um, including some of the broader journals like Nature Science, uh, et cetera. Uh, and I think that, uh, of course, uh, eLife is extremely friendly to preprints as well. Um, and you can find a list of all journal policies on Wikipedia. Uh, and what's great about this resource, um, which anyone can update, is that it also will link back to the original policies. And finally, the, the third major concern is that if I post a preprint, I'm going to get scooped. In other words, I'm putting my work out there in public, but not in an obviously well-respected forum. Um, we have had a, some conversations with Paul Ginsberg, who is a physicist, the founder of Archive, about scooping. 
And he says that, you know, in, in physics, this can't happen because archive postings are basically accepted as these priority claims. In other words, that archive is the place that everyone is looking for research. Um, and then he goes on to say that, um, you know, basically what we're worried about is using information or ideas without proper attribution. So this is really kind of a moral and ethical concern. Um, so in order to kind of change our culture about this, ASAP-BIO um, has been circulating uh, some draft statements at our first meeting, which I'll mention in a moment. And the idea being that we would like uh, to encourage scientists to feel uh, that they will cite preprints that are relevant to their work, much as they would cite a relevant paper. In other words, that um, acknowledging the citation is good scholarship, and we would like to have um, uh, a way for scientists to, to say that they will do this. So we're, we're working on this in the future. Now, despite some of these concerns, um, I, I think that preprinting is typically a very positive experience. We ran a survey uh, at our uh, website, um, and the majority of people say that preprinting is a very positive experience. So based on this, we held a meeting at HHMI in, in if I buy I should back up a moment and say, we are a group of scientists. Um, an additional organizer recently is James Frazier uh, at UCSF, who recently came out with a great um, FOSS podcast, by the way, on preprints. You should check it out. Um, but uh, we have we came together and decided to try to organize a uh, a group of junior and senior scientists, journals, uh, funders together, and to really talk about this issue. And we used um, the statements like the one that you saw to uh, kind of take the temperature of the room. We asked people whether they would endorse a statement like that, et cetera. And you can read more about this on our website. But we emerged from this meeting with a sense that preprints could really become a valuable addition to our system of communicating research. So now, um, moving forward, um, we recognize that you, know, you can't just have a meeting and say, uh, you know, declare victory, but rather this is a very long process of um, working to uh, work with funding agencies, university promotion committees, journals, um, about uh, creating policies that are clear and friendly to preprints. And perhaps more importantly, I think that we need to think about ways to engage um, each other um, and other scientists, because this is really a cultural issue. Um, if you're interested in becoming more involved with uh, ASAP Bio, with this community organized group, um, please visit our website. We have a way, uh, we are looking for people to act as ambassadors. In other words, people who are going to be willing to talk about preprints in their local institutions and as they travel around to meetings. Um, and you can sign up for that at asapbio.org slash ambassadors. I want to highlight one really recent exciting development. The NIH has just released a request for information on preprints um, that essentially asks for community opinions on how preprints are used um, and how they could benefit communication. So uh, if you have um, uh, a little bit of time before November 29th, I would highly recommend submitting a response. Um, you don't have to answer all the questions. You can, uh, responses don't have to have a minimal length. Um, they are, uh, it's a very easy way of sharing, making your voice heard. So with that, uh, I think I'm going to give the presentation back to Emmanuel, or uh, who, who should I? To me, yeah, indeed. Thank you so much, Jessica. That was absolutely brilliant. It's so much clearer, I think, at least for me. Um, so um, I was, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, we have a little bit of a poll question now coming. Um, oh, yeah, I'll great. just comment on one thing. Um, so for, before the, the poll question, one thing uh, is about concern number two. It's totally true because uh, we are actually under review in one of the journals that you have listed, and uh, we had uh, already submitted our paper to BioArchive six months before. Oh, cool. Yeah, so it is absolutely true. It can happen for real. Okay, so um, no, <laughs> the first question on this quick poll is, have you ever posted a preprint? And please choose one of the following answer, yes, no, or I'm not sure. Great. Well, woo, <laughs> it's a lot of you who haven't.
um, I can only encourage you to encourage you to do it anyway. Um, we now moving on to the, our next speaker, uh, Buzz. Buzz, are you still with us? I am. In, yes, I am. Great. Well, Buzz, could you please tell us a little bit about your view on preprints, please? Yes, absolutely. I first of all, I really enjoyed Jessica's talk about preprints, and I felt that that was a, a wonderfully sort of coherent, as an overarching explanation of the whole field. My yeah, you can tell she's the director. I know. Uh, my interest in preprints <laughs> uh, was it really started out very pragmatically. You know, as a an early career investigator, I, I felt that you know there was a, a hell of a lot of pressure to get my work out to the public. You know, to the scientific community as quickly as possible, and and I found myself being very frustrated initially with the sort of the glacial pace of traditional publishing. Um, and I'd known, you know, I'd known about Jessica's interest in in preprints for for a long time, and, and as a physicist, I'd always been aware of them, um, but I'd I'd never really um, I I'd, I'd never really taken advantage of them before that. And I thought, let's just give this a shot. There's, there's absolutely nothing to lose. Um, and doing that first pre, I, you know, doing that first preprint was one of the most sort of wonderful experiences I'd ever had. Um, you, you know, it, it sort of completely decoupled writing a piece of work, doing experiments, the existence of the work, from having it being published in a traditional venue. Uh, and I felt like it was. If anything, it was it was sort of deeply, sort of psychologically satisfying, you know, at the very least. Um, th then, you know, I decided this was this was such a great experience. I'd do it for every piece of work, um, and, and and you know, again, it starts with frustration, but it um, <laughs> but it gives you all these other it gives you all these sort of other wonderful benefits. Um, I was I, I was trying to. To describe this to um, Naomi, the uh, organizer of the panel, uh, when we when she first contacted me about appearing here, um, and I think I, I was sort of trying to describe the experience in a sort of roundabout way, and she came up with this wonderful phrase of accelerating professionalism to describe the you know the story I was telling her. So um, I thought I could share that with you. Um, we, we, we came, my team came up with this new technology for making whole genome knockout collections really quickly. And we sort of essentially, we, we had like a finished package sort of months before publication. And, and we came to submit it to a journal. And the same day we did that, we, we submitted it to BioArchive. And the moment, the moment it comes out, uh, it can be seen, you know, it can be seen worldwide, and we we sort of we just, we immediately found that we had a receptive audience for it, um, and and that getting that feedback sort of as sort of what were the strengths of it, what were the weaknesses, were wonderful, uh, and and that that and that sort of that interest led us to say, well led us to ask the question much, much sooner. What's the next paper we're going to do? Where can we focus our research efforts six, seven months ahead of where we would have been otherwise? And it also so forced us to ask the question, are we going to release more of this, more of this technique to the public? Things that, you know, for, for instance, we, we, we intended on patenting or applying for patents for. Um, so again, it forced it forced us to ask that question: Do we go through the patenting process? And by doing it sort of so far ahead of time, we were we were able to come at it in a in a much more um, in a much calmer way, uh, as in a much more considered way that I think we would have done otherwise. By doing that, it forced us to ask ourselves: You know, what's unique about this technique? What are, you know, how does it compare with other techniques in the field? And again, not from the point of view of, in, in a sort of a, a wonderfully sort of honest, pragmatic way, 
that I think we an experience we wouldn't have gotten otherwise. And that and that whole that whole chain of events took us from took us from an initial preprint, you know, through you know provisional patents, through protocol papers, through software release, um, you know, and then and then having that that sort of basis of work that sort of came out of that initial preprint, it it makes us competitive for grants months and months and months ahead of where we would have been otherwise, which I, I think is a wonderful thing. It even accelerates thinking on other projects as well. So I, I can't recommend the thing more. I, I would I, I'd recommend that everybody do it. And they 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 view this as a way to sort of help solidify their scientific thinking process as well. Um, and I think I, I, I think that's really all I have to share about it. You know, I I'd say I, I'd say everybody who's attending, you know, try and try and try and do that. Um, and I feel I feel like um, I, I, uh, I feel like uh, we should. I'm I'm happy to take questions. I was uh, so, so I was talking to Naomi yesterday in preparation for this, and, uh, and she said she said maybe we should sort of we should sort of break the ice with asking questions. Um, so so what started your interest in preprints? I know mine was sort of almost mercenary, but. I, I, I think you were the first person who I, who I ever met <laughs> in biology who did preprints. It was so wonderful. Oh really? Oh wow! Yeah. Oh, it was. Well, I, I, I had been following. Um, so I had been following printing as a way of, I, you know, I was very interested always in these new ways of communicating research. Um, Pure J, you know, uh, as a journal, seemed very interesting to me, um, and so I, you know. When um, BioArchive came online, and at the same time, Pre-J Preprints was operating, I had a side project that I was working on, and I hadn't invested that much um, time and energy into it, but I wanted to wrap it up and kind of make it, um, you know, write it up as much as possible. So that was really the first project that I posted um, in the sense that, um, you know, I felt that it would not be the only publication out of my postdoc, and so therefore it felt a little bit easier to begin with that. Um, but, you know, since I've just had such good experiences with um, all the preprints we've posted so far, um, it's definitely something that I recommend to, to everyone. Oh, that's fantastic. I, I think... Yeah, but... I'm sorry, go on. Oh, no, no, uh, I'm sorry. I, I, felt like you, I, 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 felt, I felt like you were going to say something, so please go ahead. Oh no! I mean, I, I think um, you know. I, I think one thing that I'm curious to hear about, Buzz and Nikolai, is um, how you guys get feedback from um, uh, any from preprints. Is it primarily through comments on? First of all, I guess which preprint servers are you using? And then, you know, what um, what other uh, um, you know, do you see comments through the preprint server website, or do you get comments informally? How does that work? I think I uh, the oh. from the BioArchive website, and those has been yeah. those comments have been incredibly civil, constructive, and polite, and that is something that really stands in a stark contrast with some of the anonymous peer review that we have received. Similarly to Buzz, we also had overwhelmingly positive uh, initial experience with the with the BioArchive. I, within months of submitting my preprint, I had received multiple comments from the most respected experts in the field. They weren't just comments from graduate students browsing this wow. new thing, but they came from the very founders of the field, and they were very, very constructive and thoughtful. And we actually had a, an engaging discussion on the website of the BioArchive itself. And then normally I receive many more comments by email as well of people who don't want to have the discussion in public. So it's a combination of both. Uh, but uh, similarly to Buzz, preprints were not a new concept to me with the appearance of the BioArchive because I had posted multiple math and physics papers on the archive before that. And I certainly was more hesitant of the papers because for me the key question as to whether uh, a preprint server is useful and whether it can establish priority in the community is how visible 
that uh, pre those preprints are. Because if the only people who see the preprint are your three competitors and a random fourth guy, uh, that's certainly a recipe for disaster. But on the other hand, if the preprint is being seen by thousands and thousands of leading members of the community, there is nobody who can possibly scoop you because they're going to undermine their own reputation. And what very quickly became clear to me with my own preprint that I posted on the bioarchive and that was viewed uh, over 9,000 times by now, and more globally looking at the statistics for other preprints is that preprints in biology do get tremendous amount of visibility. In some ways, they get more visibility than even papers published in traditional peer-reviewed journals. And my own experience is that even now that my paper has been published in cell reports for more than a year, uh, there are still 100, 200 new downloads from the bioarchive preprint every month. So even, wow. even after paper is published in a peer-reviewed journal, having a preprint increases the visibility of your work. And if the organizers give me a chance to share my screen, I can show some more thematic <laughs> data uh, in the distributions for number of HTML views and PDF downloads. Uh, but without showing the data, uh, what the data do show is that uh, there are hundreds of bioarchive prints that have been downloaded over a thousand times and that have been viewed many, many, many thousand times as HTML views. So I have come to think that if you have a truly exciting piece of work, putting it on the bioarchive is going to generate tremendous amount of visibility and traffic and your work will be well known. If your work is not so exciting, perhaps it will not be viewed very highly, but then the question is, does it really matter? And will it be very different, even if that work is being published in a, a peer-reviewed journal? Uh, so from that perspective, I think that BioArchive is, just as Jessica emphasized, I very, very much agree with her. I think that BioArchive is not a substitute for peer review or a sidestepping peer review. I sometimes hear this in editorials and they cringe because I think that BioArchive is embracing peer review. I received peer review by the most respected members of the community within months uh, of submitting my paper on bioarchive, and that was visible to every to everybody. If that's not peer review, I don't know what else to call it. And in general, uh, it, I I feel that preprints very much facilitate and increase the quality of peer review rather than undermine it. Um, they they work fantastically well. Uh, with the existing system. They, they just add this new dimension, which is much, much faster than what we've had so far. And they, uh, they have all the other wonderful qualities that Jessica articulated so well. So instead of um, uh, repeating more these phrases, I, uh, I would rather hear your questions and address any remaining doubts that you may have uh, that bioarchives are the way to go. Uh, sorry, I'm sending message. Sorry, but um, yeah. So anyway, so can you tell us a little bit more about how, um, in the meantime, um, preprints are used in physics? Um, because I think it's it's really amusing. I don't interact with that many physicists, uh, but when I do, I think that there's this. Um, yeah, it's kind of interesting to hear their reaction to our, you know, uh, in, infantile <laughs> cognitions on preprints. Virtually, so. virtually both the only website that most physicists check every day for new scientific work is the archive because they know that everything important is going to come out first there and they, there are certainly heuristics that are being used for filtering out which of the many preprints to read and one obvious heuristic is uh, the PI who uh, from which laboratory a particular piece of work comes out, but uh, how strangely that heuristic is being enforced obviously varies a lot from researcher to researcher, but uh, uh, it is certainly the case that for the physics community, the appearance of a preprint on the archive 
is the announcement of the work and has the meaning of, of a publication in most cases. And there was this wonderful analysis published recently uh, on, on the archive showing that uh, within the set of papers that were ultimately published in a few leading physics journals, the subset that was published to the bioarchive first was cited much, much more frequently than the subset that were published only in the journal and never deposited on the bioarchive. And the other thing that was quite startling about uh, their analysis was the peak of citations of papers that appear first on the bioarchive was just at the date when, that pap when those papers appeared in print from peer-reviewed journals. Uh, so that, which suggests that the community has read the papers, internalized them, thought about them, and incorporated them in their own thinking and analysis uh, before these papers have received the official uh, stamp of uh, anonymous peer review. Mm -hmm. And I, I am quite optimistic that uh, biology is moving in that direction. I, I see so much inertia and so much enthusiasm that uh, it is um, it is very likely, in my opinion, that uh, uh, we'll adopt the same culture. Yeah, I really hope so. I mean, I think I think the biggest uh, barrier is really just how new preprints are as a concept. I think when I talk to people about them, um, I I was talking to a group of postdocs for sort of like um, it was for a responsible conduct of research course. You know that they're obligated to be there, and therefore, <laughs> um, you know. Uh, not self-selected in any way, but the majority had never, like 90% had never heard of preprints. And so I, I think that there's still, that the, the curve is growing very, very fast, um, but I think in order to maintain uh, this rate or increase this rate, we need to be more vocal. I think Twitter, for example. On Twitter, everybody is talking about preprints, every sharing preprints, et cetera, but, um, you know, I think that that's also sort of a self-selected of people. Yeah, I very much agree with that and I'm actually of the opinion that if everybody knew what preprints really are, everybody would be using them. Uh, there, there are just <laughs> so many overwhelmingly positive reasons to, to use them yeah. as opposed to a few downsides. Um, and I do think that in the biology community there is much frustration with the slow rate of traditional peer review. Uh, there is a lot of desire to make our work uh, freely available, even if published behind the paywalls of the prestigious journal. So all of these things are there. Uh, perhaps the main break and misconception that is stopping many people from adopting preprints is the idea that uh, they will not be credited. Somehow their competitor will yeah. see their work and they will publish it in the journal first and they will get the credit for that. And uh, I'll mention just one anecdote, and then I'll give um, uh, a broader argument to that. But one anecdote is that uh, uh, much of the highly publicized legal proceedings over the uh, rights over CRISPR, Doughton versus Feng Zhang, and so on, would have been tremendously simplified if Feng Zhang had a preprint posted to document that indeed he had those ideas at the time when he claims he did. Um, and they see that I'm given a chance to show my screen. Oh. Yes, you should be able to show your screen with us now. Oh, oh great. Can you see I, my screen? I saw it, now I can't see it. <laughs> it was there. <laughs> it will come back, don't worry. Okay. We just have some technical difficulties, but thanks for carrying on. But yeah, it's, it's going to come back, Nikolai, don't okay. worry. Okay, so I'll finish my argument then without it. So one, yeah, one, one, one prominent example where having a preprint which has a public timestamp, a credible timestamp, would have tremendously simplified the legal proceedings as opposed to having um, notebooks that nobody can possibly authentic, uh, authenticate when they existed and when they were created. So that's, right. that's uh, one part. The other aspect is if for people who might be worried that their work will be seen on the bioarchive but not cited and they, they may not be credited, I, I would ask my colleagues to think uh, 
doesn't the same thing happen with peer-reviewed papers? Has it happened to you that you've published a paper, perhaps not in Nature, in another journal, and you really thought somebody should have cited it and they didn't cite it? So there, there is no publication venue that is immune of not crediting your work. It, it's really a quantitative uh, probability of how likely it is that you will be credited. And the more visibility your work gets, the higher the probability that you will be credited. And the piece of data that I'm just about to show you demonstrates in a fairly convincing way that preprints can increase visibility. So from that perspective, I think that preprints can only increase the probability of uh, uh, we receiving credit for our work rather than being the other way around. Absolutely. So, uh, that's, a, that's a very good point, Nikolai. Uh, and adding on that note, and because the word frustration has been said so many times, um, I just wanted to make one slight comment, is that um, we all started this because of the love of science. And when I was very, very young, many, many years ago, I thought that you would just go into the lab, do some experiment, and then share the result with the people who love the the science as much as you do. Um, and I think this is getting as close as that idea as possible. Um, so it's no time for us to move on to the next poll, a voting poll. So we're going to have two together um, because uh, we missed one after birth. Sorry about that. So the first of the two is how often do you visit by archive? Uh, so just choose your answer, never, once a month, once a fortnight, once a week, or more than once a week. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, 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 it's less dramatic than the first vote, I yeah. must say. Um, there is still improvement there, but room for improvement. Okay, and our third poll. Um, so this is the third one. Would you recommend preprint? Uh, sorry, would you comment on preprints about your research in your field? Yes, you do. Yes, you do sometimes. Maybe you would. No, you never do, or you don't know. Oh, not too bad. Okay, so maybe. <laughs> um, I thought that at this point, maybe people would know a little bit more about maybe. Um, all right, so I think it's time for us to start to wrap up and go into questions. So, um, Naomi. Oh, before Hello, you do that, everyone. can I just make uh, a little ad? Sure, go, just okay. uh, may I just, uh, So, um, it's actually quite possible to get prints delivered to you instead of having to repeatedly check bioarchive.org or any of the other preprint sites. So most preprint servers are indexed on Google Scholar. So if you sign up for Google Scholar alerts to be delivered to your email, they will include preprints. And also there's a couple new great search engines, including one called PrePubMed, where you can set up an RSS feed of all preprint servers in biology, and then you can in return get that delivered to you. And there's all, the Open Science Framework is also building a search tool as well. So I just want to note that you don't have to go to the website to, to keep up to date with preprints. So. Excellent point. Thank you so much for that. So it's now Naomi's turn with everybody's questions, and we have quite a few, so let's go and start with that. This is fantastic. We've had lots of questions come through. Thank you for everyone who bought, um, bed with us through the middle of that webinar. We had some technical glitches, so I appreciate all of your patience, and thank you to panelists who are fantastic at carrying on. So we've got lots of questions to ask. What I'll do is I'll feed the questions to Emmanuel. Um, and the panelists, if you'd like to step up and answer, if you feel it's appropriate for you to answer, and I think we'll carry on like that. We have lots to answer, so this is brilliant. If you keep, if you want to send a question in, there's a question box on the webinar software that you can use. Um, it's probably be best at now, at the moment. You could also tweet um, to eLife Careers, but we're more likely to see a question in the question box, so that would be fantastic. Okay, so I will pass back to Emmanuel to go through some of these questions. Thank you, so her, the first question is how far are we to index preprints on PubMed or PMC Europe? And that comes from uh, Kevin Rotto, sorry about the 
pronunciation. Anybody wants okay. to jump in for that one? Jessica. Um, uh, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, I think there's a long history of the National Library of Medicine in the U.S. Um, being willing to consider only uh, articles that have been peer-reviewed. So I think that, um, you know, preprints are probably not going to be being appearing on the U.S. PubMed um, soon, um, certainly. Uh, but I think that that doesn't mean that they, they can't be discoverable to scientists. Uh, as I just mentioned, I think that Google Scholar is already doing a great job of making these visible. And many, um, many biologists I know are already using Google Scholar as well. So um, I think that, um, the, you know, if, if you believe that NIH um, should have adopt um, policies or consider preprints more strongly, um, I think the NIH RFI, um, which I mentioned earlier, um, I think it is open for everyone to comment, would be a great menu um, in which to indicate your feelings about um, how preprints are used in your field and could be used. Great, thank you. Anybody else to comment on this? I, I'll just add that Google Scholar is a terrific tool that does index okay. all preprints. Good. I, I agree. Um, I, so, sorry. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. That's, that's, no, no, go ahead, Beth. Uh, just to second Nikolai's point, just now and from earlier on, I think Google Scholar is a wonderful tool in part, you know, for preprints in part because it can associate, say, a preprint with a, a sort of a peer-reviewed article that's behind a paywall. So, so what I've done, you know, for articles is take the, the sort of the final version of the manuscript and then upload it to the preprint server after it's been sort of the text has been finalized so that you can sort of circumvent the paywall in essence in way, essentially yes like nobody's called me on it so yeah. I, I think it, it's i think that's a wonderful way that you can get your work out more public that's sort of to a broader audience especially the if thing basis that for most journals this does not even violate their copyrights because even if they don't allow you to share their formatted version uh, most journals do allow you to share your formatted version coming from uh, uh, from your manuscript. And if you use LaTeX uh, to typeset it, in fact, it might look much better than the published version. Exactly. And, and if you think about it, that's how PubMed Central works in many cases as well. So I, I don't see that there's in any way a problem about doing that. Uh, and it means, say, if your work is biotechnologically relevant, it's much more accessible to say people in startups who can't afford journal subscriptions, for instance, uh, which I think is a wonderful thing. You know that you know we we as academics in the universities have access to this enormous world of peer-reviewed literature thanks to our libraries. Most of the world doesn't have that, you know, especially people who are doing really interesting sort of commercially relevant stuff. And just one more short addition beyond Google yeah. Scholar. Google itself ranks very, very highly everything published in preprints. And I don't know about others, but I use Google a lot to search for things. So that's very useful. Yeah, I do that too, actually. Um, so our next question is, do preprints affect smaller labs versus larger labs differently? Anybody uh, for that one? I'll take this one. So I yes, certainly... You can I uh, larger labs, uh, I'll just interpret larger meaning more established with larger visibility. Uh, for them, uh, the reputation of the laboratory and the principal investigator can certainly add more visibility to a preprint and can certainly reduce the probability of the idea being stolen in some way. But on the other hand, I have seen very many examples of preprints coming from uh, not so influential, not so well-established labs that are exciting enough and that get picked up by the community and via the Twitter, via the social networks, uh, via email, uh, these papers are still downloaded uh, many, many thousands of times. They're cited frequently, even as a preprint. Uh, so uh, the probability of your work being visible as a preprint clearly depends on how famous the lab is, which, by the way, is true for a nature paper, too. Uh, but if the work itself is intriguing enough and strong enough, I think that it can be noticed on its own right without having famous authors. 
like anybody yeah, else? Yeah, I mean, I just want to add. I would just like to add to that. I think that, um, yeah, that, that certainly, um, I think Nicola's point is completely correct, but that during peer review, um, you know, sometimes there, um, some have said that peer review is sometimes dependent upon connections between um, the PI of the lab and, you know, editors and, and people in the field. And so it may be easier for a more established person to find a friendly reception during peer review. And with peer, and with preprints, at least um, those junior people are able to get their work out um, in a citable way. So in, in that sense, I really think it is kind of like leveling the playing field a little bit. I, I completely agree with you, Jessica. I think that preprints are sort of a wonderfully democratizing tool for sort of allowing small labs to sort of capture the eyeballs of the world. Um, and and I've, I've always felt that having that initial release or maybe even second release as a preprint, remember you can always come back and amend a preprint in a way that you can't do with a, pre, a peer reviewed paper, um, is that it gives you a, a sort of multiple bites at the cherry of getting people's attention, which I, I think for a, you know, a, a young lab that's trying to establish itself is, is much more important than it would be, say, for an established lab, which you know, already has the community's attention. All right, thank you guys. Um, this is very clear and I hope this is answering Lisa's question. Um, so we're now going to move to our uh, final poll question. Um, so this is the last question for today. Would you read short commentaries that highlight recent notable preprints? Yes, no, or I'm not sure. <laughs> wow, this is a pretty, I'm sorry, I, I have access to the result <laughs> a few seconds before everybody else, but this is a pretty clear answer, okay. <laughs> Um, well, this is great. Uh, so carrying on now with the questions, uh, we've got a question uh, from Twitter. So Gunter on Twitter is uh, asking, what is the benefit of publishing in a journal after posting to BioArchive? That actually oh, is a good I, question. I, I, okay, I can just jump in really quickly and say that I think <laughs> journals are playing a really important role in um, our scientific ecosystem in the sense that Another peer review is, um, you know, I, I, at least, well, let me put it this way. Peer review that is organized in a less biased way um, than uh, perhaps somebody asking um, their friends, right? I think that is still a very valuable thing. And journals provide an essential way of stamping credibility on papers. Um, I think that we as humans need metrics and and heuristics for understanding what to read and what to pay attention to. I think that in the future we can figure out other ways of doing this, but um, from the perspective of uh, uh, Lon Vale and Tony Hyman, who wrote a really, really wonderful um, article, I think it appeared in eLife, uh, about the separation of publication into the steps of disclosure and um, they call it validation. The idea being that you can disclose work in a preprint and then have it evaluated or validated in a journal. And those are kind of separate things. Um, you know, I think that right now those are steps are kind of wrapped up together. Um, but there's real value in, in, in removing them. So, but I'll let the other panelists weigh in on this. I, I think you put that in such a lovely way, Jessica. Like I, I, I realized with, with going through the whole preprint experience that so in the past, when scientific information was disseminated on paper, journals um, journals were sort of in charge of uh, publicizing it, sort of stamping it with credibility, and then and then disseminating it. You know, in terms of like a, a sort of a printed volume, with, sort of with electronic media. For you know, for the past twenty years or so, we've behaved as if that system still existed. You know, the journals were in charge of credibility, publicity, and sort of dissemination as well. Now though, you know, with things like preprints, we can completely decouple those things. You know, a, a preprint is, you know, can be the initial dissemination method. And I think the role for the journals now is to act almost as like curators of that sort of vast amount of information that comes out. They can help us as scientists sort of sort out the small amount probably of stuff that shouldn't be out there 
And they can also serve to sort of highlight things that everybody should, you know, everybody should have their eyeballs on. Uh, and I think that's that's an amazingly um, you know that's an amazingly valuable ser service. There's there's far more information in the world from the scientific community than any one person, especially like a practicing scientist who has to be in the lab, you know, writing grants, could possibly you know, assimilate. Um, so I, I think you know their 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 role I think is is actually preprints help really define their role I think much more clearly now than they did say five years than their role was defined five years ago great point Buzz. and this is so well supported by the results from the last poll everybody expressed desire to read commentaries highlighting the preprint and they think that's one of the functions a journal can serve exactly like I we we were you know recently uh, invited to submit a uh, uh, an article to a journal, and I think in part it was on str on the sort of the, sh the sort of strength of the response to the preprints. So you can see you can see that maybe the journals are actually using them now as a way to sort of figure out what do we take. They are. I, I've heard that Plus recently recruited editors whose uh, job is specifically to go through bio archive and choose papers to. Uh, to be peer reviewed by Plus Genetics, we invite the authors to submit them uh, to the Plus Genetics. I think that's like such an am amazingly wonderful thing. You, you sort of you have access to this wealth of information now about a paper. Like you don't have to sort of use your gut on you know is this going to resonate with people or not. You know you have actually a sort of actionable metrics now. Uh, and you, you know it can it can also support peer review as well if you think about it. You know. You know, traditionally, I think peer review has been sort of almost a very harried process for the reviewers. You know, they're they're cut off from all of their sources of information about this thing. Now they can see what you know potentially thousands of viewers have said about it. You know, might have decided. You know, have they decided to download it? Have they read it? Um, so so I, I think it, this actually, you know. This has the potential, I think, to just dramatically strengthen peer review, actually, and you know, dramatically improve the credibility of scientific work sort of going forwards. Yeah, thank you so much, Buzz, for that. Um, I think that's a very important point. Um, it's like uh, reshaping the entire publishing world and um, everybody that is at stake of that, including the reviewers. So in the interest of time, we're just going to finish uh, by asking each of you guys uh, one question. So um, it, this is a question from Adriana, and she says, uh, preprints are great with the caveats that have been mentioned, but do you think that preprints will eventually replace the current system of journal submission or peer review? Or how would you reconcile the two ways of sharing science, with one being peer-reviewed and the other one who isn't, in terms of equal acceptance for jobs, fellowships, etc.? So, just because of interest of time, I need a yes or no from each of you, Buzz, Jessica, and Nikolai. Who starts? So, can we clarify whether the question is, will preprints replace peer review, or will peer review and preprints replace journals? Um, I think both the reconciliation, I think the main question is really how do you recon uh, reconcile the two like in the same world and how would that impact yeah. on uh, acceptance and like fellowships, publications, grants, you know, like being the first author of a big paper still is uh, one of the major metrics one of these days. Okay. Um, yeah. I, I don't think I can say that in yes or no, but I can say it in one sentence if I can try. Okay, sure. um, <laughs> one sentence, so you have less than a minute. Um, it's important to be able to show interim progress of our research, um, yet peer review is still a really important process for the validation and growth of science. And we need to make peer review, I would love in the, in the future for peer review to be a more dynamic process so that um, we can continue to improve work and build upon work over time. Great. Well done. Nikolai, yes or no? 
preprints are certainly com compatible with peer review. We we need peer review. It's going. It's here to stay with us. So I, I see the journal system currently being mostly submit uh, consistent with preprints, and we can certainly enhance their compatibility in the future. Uh, there, there are forward-looking journals that already allow the direct submission of preprints for peer review. But uh, yes, I, I do see them even now as being compatible. That's my short answer. And in the future, I can see them being even more compatible. And I want to emphasize again one popular misconception that the preprints sidestep peer review. I, I vehemently deny that. They do not sidestep peer review. We need peer review. I love preprints. I love peer review. I want both of them to stay with us. Thank you so much for that. And Buzz, but just one sentence, yes or no? I think they're they're naturally complementary. Uh, I think that pre pre Sorry, we don't have to stop with that. I'm very very sorry. I would love to hear the argument, but really we are really really running um, okay. <laughs> short on time. I'm so sorry. So I know I have to thank everybody uh, for being so supportive, uh, being here, sharing your enthusiasm and your know preprints, uh, everybody for attending and uh, asking all your questions. We're going to be in touch about this and please guys be in touch with us about this as well. Uh, use our Twitter with uh, the hashtag ECR Wednesday at eLife Careers um, as much as possible because that means we can see them. Uh, and um, okay. And thank you just to add, we are live on Twitter now for the next hour. The panelists will be joining us there. So there were lots of questions that did not get answered. We're very sorry about that. Please do post those on Twitter and we'll try to do that for you as well. And I hope we can get your questions answered one way or the other. That We may be able to follow up with the panelists as well by email because some were very specific. So thank you for joining us and we'll say goodbye from here and we'll see you on Twitter. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you so much.